Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to everybody joining us from around the globe. St. Andrew's alumni, parents, and friends, we're thrilled to have you here for this Meet the Author series with Emma Seckel. My name is Moira Sharkey, and I serve as a gift officer in the development office for the University of St. Andrews. True to our global community, I am joining you today from just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. As part of the development office, I have the great privilege of engaging our alumni, parents, and friends to support the university philanthropically and to foster a strong St. Andrews community all across the world. For today's Meet the Author event, it is my absolute honor to welcome our author and alumna, Emma Seckel. We'll start today hearing from Emma herself about her time at St. Andrews and her journey as an author, followed by a reading from The Wild Hunt, and then we'll open it up to your questions. So please do be thinking of your questions and get ready to pop those into the chat function at any time. Emma is a 2017 graduate of St. Andrews, having received her master's in English. Originally from Canada, Emma stayed in the British Isles after graduating, and she's currently pursuing a master's from the University of Cambridge. The Wild Hunt has been called the best book of the summer by BuzzFeed, Lit Hub, and Library Journal. As we're transitioning into fall and looking at Halloween at the end of the month, at least over here in the States, it is the perfect, perfect spooky read. And I can attest to how absolutely terrifying it is at parts while also heartwarming. Uh, so as I said, I would recommend some tissues because you're gonna go on an emotional roller coaster as well as all the thrills that come along with understanding the Slua and what they mean to the people of this island. So the New York Times has called the hunt the wild hunt melodic, and it's a perfect, perfect description to this dance as humans and Slua are counterparts on this remote Scottish island. Emma, we are so delighted to have you back home in St. Andrews. Even, you know, you can tell Cambridge that we found you first, uh, and we can't wait to go through the wild hunt with you. So now I will turn it over to you, Emma. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for having me. I'm so excited to, to be doing this event with St. Andrews. Um, so yeah, so I'm just gonna start off by reading the first, the opening bit of the novel, just to sort of, you know, set the stage, set the scene. Uh, on the 1st of October, they arrived. They gathered in places they could see the whole island, the rolling hills and the farmland, sitting in trees and on curbs, on barns and along low pasture walls across from the church and atop the green moss glow of the epitaph in the shadows of the high street. In October, the crows always came in threes. Dawn was about to break and on the beach, Lee Wells watched her father burn. It was a small funeral party, a girl, a man, the minister, a border collie sitting dutifully next to them, a few others scattered across the beach. If Lee had asked, probably more people would have shown up. But when the minister appeared at her door the day after she'd arrived, she made it clear that she didn't want a lot of fuss. The boat burned only with the help of a great deal of petrol struggling against the incoming tide. A man waded out into the water to attempt to push it back out to sea without displacing the shrouded figure nestled within. Lee called to him to be careful, but the wind reclaimed her words into air. This wind was indiscriminate in what it took and only fragments of the minister's committal reached Lee's ears, the body of our brother Graham, which had gone numb with the cold. The collie, Maisie, nudged her wet nose into Lee's palm and the sky slowly lightened through indigo to violet to purple to pale mauve. Lee watched her father's body burn dust to dust and wondered if he'd care how many of the islanders showed up. Likely not. If Lee did not like a lot of fuss, she'd learnt how from him. Besides, it didn't matter how many people were there. Her brother Sam was not. The boat crested a wave and seemed finally to be on its way out and the flames grew stronger, taller, brighter, in the sure and certain hope of resurrection until they hurt Lee's eyes to look at. Above her and behind, the stone circle towered on the bluff, perched on one of the stones, three crows, inky punctuation. The man, Tom, waded back into shore, drenched from the top of his head to the hems of his trousers. He trudged up the beach, shoes squelching, and rejoined the little funeral party, patted Maisie once on the head, scrubbed the water from his hair, and turned to face the sea. Oh, there's so much amazing, amazing imagery in this book, Emma. I can't wait to dig into it with you. But but let's start at the beginning. As, as this is an alumni event. Let's start with your journey as an alumna from Canada over to St. Andrews to study English. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And then we'll get into the book itself. 
Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so I grew up in in Vancouver, Canada, um, but my mom's side of the family is um, a, a large part of her family are are from England. So we, you know, had come over to the UK um, a lot when I was growing up. We would sort of save up all of our wouldn't do, <laughs> wouldn't do much like fun entertainment stuff during the year. Save up all our money and go on a, a big trip to to see family in the summer. So I'd been coming over to the UK quite a lot, and when it came time to uh, to look at, at universities, I knew I really wanted to go away um, for school and going to the UK felt like a really natural move and a little bit like, you know, despite being so far away, a little bit less foreign because I'd, I'd been been over on this side of the Atlantic and so many times. Um, and I had uh, one of my friend's older sisters actually went to St. Andrews, graduated the year before I arrived, and she just had nothing but great things to say about St. Andrews. Um, and then I also really liked the degree structure. Um, it was sort of the perfect balance for me between, you know, getting to, to focus more on what I already knew I was interested in compared to like a liberal arts degree back home um, or a degree where I'd have to take, you know, some sciences and some maths and things like that that I wasn't really interested in. But I liked that I could take um, more than one subject right off the bat. So it was sort of a perfect the perfect combination um, of factors for me. And then I, I came and visited during the summer before I applied and just fell in love with the town and, and yeah, ended up at St. Andrews and had a fantastic four years. Oh, I love hearing that. That's wonderful. <laughs> Go ahead. And, you know, obviously you studied English at St. Andrews, but did you know early on that you wanted to be an author? Did you come into university with the expectation that you were going to write a book someday? Well, I'd already started writing books um, when I came to university. I wrote many, many terrible, terrible books um, as a teenager. Um, I'm sure we could dispute that, but oh, <laughs> it's pretty. They'll we'll have to read they're them. They're pretty bad. Them. Oh no, they're they will never see the light of day. They're they're quite awful. Um, but so yeah, so I was already um, writing a lot and and specifically writing writing novels. Um, so it was, yeah, one of my sort of hobbies already. Um, and I actually started working on this book in my last year at St. Andrews. So there was, you know, overlap, overlap there. Sure. sure. And and stay with that for a second. So what, yeah. what was the seed? I mean, where did this book come from? How did this bring to mind for you the, the you know, the combination of the island and the folklore? You know, tell, tell mm -hmm. us the journey that this book began with. Yeah, so yeah, like I said, I started writing it in my my fourth year at St. Andrews. Um, it's changed a lot since then, but but St. being at St. Andrews was a real um, sort of impetus for the book. I wanted to write something set in Scotland, and um, the the island um, in the book actually has a lot of you know if you've been to St. Andrews, you sort of start to recognize little call outs um, to St. Andrews, and you know part of what was really interesting to me, um, especially coming from a big city and then and then being in St. Andrews was the real sense of community and how, you know, my friends and I used to joke, and I think this was more widespread than just us, but if you didn't leave for something, you know, 15 minutes early, you'll be 15 minutes late because you'll run into everyone you've ever met in your entire life. Um, and so that really sort of that that community and that, you know, being in the bubble and feeling sort of removed from um, removed from the world in a lot of ways in this um, quite unique, um, beautiful, uh, historic place, um, I found really inspiring. So I wanted to write something that sort of captured that feeling. Um, and I've always been more interested in writing um, things with at least a little bit of a speculative uh, twist or a speculative edge, um, as opposed to you know contemporary or straight fiction. So I, I started looking for um, some folklore that I could that I could weave in to the book um, in that sort of uh, semi fantastic um, magical realist sort of way, um, and that's how I came across the legend of the Slua, um, which is how I'm going to pronounce it, and we're all going to just to pretend that it's right for now. <laughs> Absolutely, it sounds good I to me. No idea if it is, <laughs> but that's how I've been saying it. So. Um, yeah, so I came across 
um, that legend. It's it's uh, a part of of Scottish Celtic, but also um, sort of all Celtic folklore is Irish, Manx, um, Breton, and has parallels in other cultures as well. Um, it's part of a it's part of a folklore motif called the Wild Hunt, which is where the the title of the book comes from, um, and it can be found sort of all across northern uh, northern European mythology. So it's also in in Norse mythology. The Valkyrie are considered, you know, a similar um, similar type of of folklore of myth. Um, so yeah, so I, I found the found the bit of folklore that I wanted to use, and then and then it seemed really natural to me to sort of take the 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 bubble feeling of St. Andrews and and amplify that to to really to to make this like a true island as opposed to just we're all lazy and never leave. <laughs> right. Oh, <laughs> kind of it's island, so fascinating so. to me that it seems like you started with the community. You know, you started yeah. with, with this group of people who just, you know, happened to be together by whatever chance, you know, birth or, you know, this you know, random move, whatever it may be. I think of Mrs. Kavanaugh, who, you know, became a real central figure at the end of the mm -hmm. book, a real key figure at the end of the book, and and the chance that brought her there, right? Her daughter marrying Ian. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but that's so interesting that you started with the community and then layered on kind of that supernatural and the folklore. That's an amazing combination. Wow. Um, <laughs> I, I want to jump to the next question. So I'm going to selfishly pepper you with a few more, but we have loads of people that I can see are online. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and type your questions into the chat. I will go ahead and read those for Emma uh, and we'll publish them and she can respond to them. But don't be bashful, which you only have to say once to a St. Andrews crowd. So, so absolutely feel free to pepper Emma with questions about publishing and the book itself and the, her experience as an author. Uh, and so I want to stay with the, the combination then of the community and the folklore, but also talk about the history. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. it's, a, is it, it's also historical fiction, you know, talking about World War II. And again, like the imagery that you call up about what happened with, you know, the RAF pilots and, you know, their experience and the way that experience lived for them beyond the war. You know, talk to us a little bit about how you conducted research on the historical side and wove that in and how important it was to you in, in telling the story in an authentic way. Yeah, totally. So it wasn't a post-war novel when it started. I was being sort of purposely, in early drafts, sort of purposely coy about when it was taking place. It was sort of vaguely 20th century, um, but I hadn't pinned down the time period at all. And as I was sort of working through those drafts, I realized that, you know, that was just opening up. It didn't feel like a it didn't feel like a sort of an honest way to to tell the story because, you know, so much happens <laughs> in the 20th century that the the thematic elements of the particular folklore that I was engaging with, you know, calls up. And I came to the conclusion that if I was coy about the date, you know, people were going to spend the whole book being like, OK, but is this like, is this really about the First World War or is this really about the Depression? Is this really about the Second World War? Um, and it was just going to be distracting as opposed to um, sort of whatever the opposite of distracting is, um, streamlining. So um, I right, it was to kind say, of grounding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think so. I so I decided that I needed to to specify when when we were. Um, um, and I I knew that I wanted it to be a book about aftermath. It's not about the event itself. It's about aftermath. Um, and so I decided that World War II made a lot of sense. Um, there were a lot of thematic parallels between, especially the decision to make Ian um, a bomber pilot was very um, came very easily. It was seemed quite obvious to me because of the similarities between. Um, you know the the visual of these birds that fly in these these huge flocks um, and are sort of sort of morally neutral. Um, they they you know have this devastating effect, um, but they're not necessarily you know I think a lot of the book is engaging with the idea that they're not necessarily evil themselves. Um, and so I thought that that parallel to the the bomber streams, um, the way that that bomber pilots flew during the Second World War, you know, they would they would all take off from various bases around the country, meet at a secondary location, and then fly over in in the bomber stream. Which was um, the idea was that it was safer for the pilots um, 
to be in in sort of tight formation. Um, and I thought that the the just the visual of that, and so so Ian um, having not really expected to make it through the war because of you know what the statistics on and the life expectancy for bomber pilots was um, to now be back on this on this island um, with that sort of visual reminder every year coming back. Um, and also a lot of the book is about it's about aftermath and it's about change and it's about modernity um, in a lot of ways because you know you have this this tight-knit remote community and their first real engagement with modernity is in the in the context of this sort of cataclysmic world event you know they're only just starting to get you know radios and telephones and things like that right before um, the war starts so they go from being this very remote sort of traditional community um, to having this contrast of you know things that they didn't even know this technology existed before it was being used to deliver mass destruction and so that idea of um, you sort of the foundation of of your life and your community shifting um, was was something that I wanted to explore. So, so setting it um, post war uh, came very really naturally. The research was quite quite extensive. A lot of it didn't make it into the book. Um, there used to be a lot a lot more about um, Ian's experience as a pilot that ended up getting cut because it wasn't it wasn't really serving the book as much as it was serving uh, my desire to prove how much research I had done. Um, so yeah, the research you did a lot. Was, I did a lot. Amazing. I did a lot. Oh I found it really it, one, one thing that was really interesting was that I found it much harder to research to write a novel where I was then going to be able to, you know, bend the truth and and sort of pastiche things together as I wished um, than I ever did find it like ever found research for you know, I did modern history at St. Andrews um, my first two years, and I found researching for those essays way easier. Um, I think it's quite hard to research for fiction in that you have to feel like you have a really good grasp on sort of specifics to be able to craft like an individual um, who's had these experiences. So it was a it was a really interesting process. Um, I worked with a lot of primary sources, um, spent a lot of time in the National Archives um, in Q with with RAF uh, sources. So everything that happens to Ian um, during the war happened to someone. They're all real um, oh, events. Oh, wow. They've that been, is fascinating. Yeah. Oh, my they, gosh. They've been tweaked a bit, but but everything's based in in reality. Um, they obviously didn't all happen to the same the same people, but all of these things are um, none of them are sort of fanciful. Um, even some of the things that seem sort of unbelievable um, are are based in in reality, and that was really important to me because um, I I feel quite strongly that whenever you're working with with speculative fiction or magical realism, it's 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 not going to work unless the the real world, the parts of the world that are familiar to the reader, feel really real, um, so that you have that sort of shared understanding of the foundation that you're coming from before you then say also these birds are like essentially ghosts, right? right? You need to be able to bring people along with you and have it feel feel concrete and and recognizable so that then you can, you know, have those those twists. Sure, sure. And you know, it seems like with with the the history and the storytelling, you know, you leave so many crumbs along the way that that really makes sense as you come to the end of the book mm -hmm. and it all ties together in those last couple of chapters and, you know, Lee and Ian's quest um, to find their friend Hugo. You know, it's amazing to see, though, how how it all ties together. And so in, in doing that, as you're writing the book, you know, it, it's this sequential story of this singular October. But it also dips back in, into so many different times in the last decade or so of this island's life. And so how how did you keep it all straight? Like, how, how did you keep the storyline straight in your head and plant so many crumbs for, for the readers along the way that all wrapped up so beautifully and so emotionally at the end? Yeah, I had, I mean, I found um, the, the dates were frustrating at times, especially for Ian, um, to make sure that you know, the type of plane that he flew was in production at the time. I needed it to be for him to fly it and, and 
you know, when X, Y, Z happens. So I had a lot of, and just figuring out like how old people had to be and, you know, keeping all that straight, um, was, was challenging. I had a lot of sticky notes with dates. I still have, I have a calendar of, um, a 1949 October calendar saved on my phone. So I knew like what that would be amazing to see, right? That is so cool. Yeah. To to sort of map it out. Um, so, so there was a lot of that for the, in terms of, you know, the, the structure of the book, um, it, it took me five years from starting to write it to publication for this book to, to be, to be finished. So a lot of that is just, um, you know, I, I got to the point where I was very familiar. I knew exactly where I was going. And, and so then once you have, you know, your first draft or your 15th draft or wherever you're at, um, it becomes easier to then you can say, okay, I need to pepper in X, Y, Z in this place. And you can sort of go back and, and massage it that way. Um, but, um, a lot of the book also came really late. Um, you know, the, the, I, I often joke that my early drafts are, um, uh, all vibes, no plot. Um, and, and so I did a, a huge plot revision um, with my agents before selling the book. So a lot of the sort of structure of the book in its current form only came then, but that, what that meant was that I already had a really strong sense of where I wanted this sort of emotional, um, thematic elements of the story to go. So it became easier. So I was really crafting a plot around that, um, that thematic atmospheric, um, emotional backdrop. Um, which, which also made it easier to make sure that I was, you know, keeping all these threads moving towards, towards the end goal. Your process is so fascinating. And I'm sure for, <laughs> for some, for, for so many people, right. Who, who have that similar ambition of, of being able to tell a story in the way you do. I think that, that understanding the different ways that you can go about weaving together such a powerful story is so helpful. And I want to, I want to dig into that in a little bit about mm-hmm. the publishing process. But right now I want to go to a question um, from Rebecca uh, asking, what was your favorite thing overall about writing the book? Oh gosh, about writing the book. Hmm. I found it really rewarding working with my editor, um, Maisie Cochran at Tin House. She's just unbelievable. Um, and so I did, I'd done a, a really big plot revision with my my agents, and then we sold the book to Tin House, and then I did another another round of revisions with with Maisie, and it's just it was so rewarding to work with an editor who really knew what I was trying to do. And in a lot of instances knew what I was trying to do better than I knew um, what I was trying to do. Um, So that was really rewarding. And that was sort of the first, you know, I'd I'd had, you know, early readers and, and critiques from, from agents, et cetera. Um, But that was the first time that I really sort of got to engage with my own work as literature as well. Um, and and have those conversations about like okay what are what are we saying here what is this what is this doing for the novel um, so that was really really rewarding um, and just such a fantastic editorial experience and made um, doing some some pretty tight turnaround <laughs> revisions made them really satisfying and and really exciting. Oh, that's great. So to, to see somebody, you know, understand and appreciate your work and be able to yeah. kind of guide that final process through to fruition. And so uh, talk about like what it was like for you finding agents and, you know, yeah. finding the right editor, because it is so important that that those people are the right types of partners. And so how did you go about that? Yeah, so I, I followed a pretty traditional publishing route. I had um, finished, you know, many drafts um, of the novel had friends read it, rewrote, 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 and then I um, I queried agents. I mean, we had a list of um, agents who I thought might be a good fit, um, and the best way that I found the best way to to figure that out is to go look at the backs of your favorite books or books that are sort of similar to what you're working on, and and see they'll you almost always be you know the first or second person thanked in the acknowledgments, um, depending on if you liked your agents or your editor better. Um, people often say um, there is no such hierarchy in my own acknowledgments. I think I did it much more chronologically because I love everyone who who worked on this book with me. 
Um, but yeah, so I had a, a list of people that I wanted to contact. You send out um, what's called a query letter, which is one of the most challenging things you'll have to write. You know, writing a book is is feels easy compared to writing a query letter where you have to summarize basically your book in about a paragraph and a half um, and, and sell it. Um, so I queried my agents, um, Catherine Drayton and Claire Friedman at uh, Inquil Management based out of New York. And we had a long phone call and talked about sort of where we all saw the book going. Um, they had already <laughs> they had already identified that I was a little slight on plot. So uh, they had me do up an outline for where I saw um, you know, a, a potential revision going. Uh, so we did that, they liked it. I signed with my agents, that was in the summer of 2020. Um, I did a big rewrite that fall, um, was told that it was <laughs> clocking in at about 20,000 words too long, <laughs> did a big, a big cut in the early winter and spring of 2021. And then we entered, um, we submitted it to, to editors in, I think it was May of 2021, um, which is a very stressful process. Uh, a lot of email refreshing. Um, and um, my editor, Maisie, actually used to work with Catherine, one of my agents. And so they they felt that um, they were pretty confident that the book was something she'd be interested in. So we, and she was, and so we had a, a great phone call and again, talk about where we saw the book going, her vision for the book. Um, and, you know, we just hit it off right away. So I, I signed signed with them. Um, we turned around the book pretty quickly for publishing. It, we signed, I signed in, I think it was in July of 2021 and it came out um, just over a year later. Wow. Oh, that's so interesting. And, and uh, you know, fascinating again to hear that like everybody saw the theme, like everyone saw yeah. the impact that this book was going to have and the, the emotional side of it. And it was just, you know, fill, filling in the little blanks there. That's mm -hmm. incredible. Wow. And so yeah. we have, oh, sorry, go ahead, Emma. Oh, I was just going to say, I was so lucky to have have a team that really, you know, believed in the book, even when it wasn't quite where it, it needed to be. And even when there were a lot of things that were still going to change, you know, people saw where it was, where it was going to go. And I was, yeah, very lucky to have that sort of vision from, from the people, the people working on the book. That's wonderful. And, you know, Trevor has a question kind of uh, building on that. You know, to what extent did your four years at St. Andrews influence your ability to write a whole novel? Yeah, well, I am a perpetual overwriter. Um, I always write to, I get, I'm- Those I are those 20,000 words. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's so it, much it to was, cut. <laughs> it was a lot. Um, I, I got to a point in St. Andrews where I became quite superstitious about it and I'd be worried that if I hadn't had to cut like a thousand words from an essay, then it clearly wasn't a very good essay. Um, so one of the things that St. Andrews really helped with was my ability to cut words, um, which came in, in very handy. But I also just think that um, the quite self-motivated structure of study at St. Andrews, especially, um, you know, I did my, my fourth year dissertation, especially that, um, you know, helps with developing that that ability to just get up and work on something a little bit every day or every other day. Um, so, so I think, yeah, it was a lot of those those skills, those sort of concrete skills, um, really came in handy uh, for the sort of more more technical, um, less glamorous <laughs> sides of of book writing. Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, you know, it took five years to write. And, you know, so we mm -hmm. so we had the question from Rebecca about, you know, what was your favorite part overall? I guess my question is, what was the hardest part? Like, were, were there moments where you just weren't sure that the story would be told? Yeah, the hardest part was plotting, for sure. I find plot really challenging. I'm not a plot based writer. I am a mood, vibes, theme based writer. So, so you know, even in, in early drafts, I also was not much of an, because of that, I wasn't much of an outliner. Um, I have been, <laughs> I've been forced into being an outliner now by people who know that that's what I need. Um, but so, yeah, so coming up with the, the actual, you know, propulsive elements of the novel, I, I found really hard. I find really challenging. I still find it challenging. Um, so doing that, that outline for my, for my agents before signing with them was, was hard and, and quite, stressful <laughs> um 
but otherwise, you know, the things that are hard are just, yeah, getting up and writing it and writing to a, to a deadline is hard and, and sitting through those periods where you know that people who have the power to, you know, take it somewhere or not, um, are reading it and just having to wait. And, you know, people say all the time how much rejection there is in, in being a writer. And it's, it's true. You know, um, I queried lots of agents and we submitted to lots of publishing houses and you only need one, um, which is fantastic. Um, but you do have to get used to people saying, you know, I'm not the right person or I don't see where this is going to go. Um, and just be able to trust the people who, who do believe in your book, um, and who, who, are passionate about it that that it's going to find its home and it's going to find the right home and so you know who are the people for you that um that you would turn to in those moments that that when you needed that that extra motivation that you know extra reminder of you know your potential and where you were going with this you know how how did you fill your bucket when you needed it throughout this process yeah so my once i signed with my agents my agents um are are really supportive um they're fantastic but i also you know um a, a friend from st andrews um katie her name's katie she has read every draft of this book and some of them were very long and very meandering and all vibes no plot and she read all of them and had you know really insightful comments and and you know was was so important to to the process and the shape that this this book ended up taking. So, you know, she was sort of my my go-to gal um, and remains so with with other projects. Um, and she was another person who really sort of saw what it was that I was was trying to do and what I was getting at and and believed in in the book right away. Um, and then I also had I I was briefly at a, a writing program in New York City and um, became very close with one of my instructors there, um, who's a, a working novelist, Anne Hood, and she, who um, blurbed the book, actually, her quotes on, on the front cover. And she was also really, really supportive um, throughout the process and, and really believed that the, the story was going to go somewhere. Yeah, it sounds like it, you know, it takes a village to uh, publish a book, yeah. for sure. Uh, it really does. And so diving a little bit more back into the story, you know, the the characters that you created, each one of them is so rich. And I love, you know, the backstory of each one with Lee coming back to the island, you know, Ian going through what he's going through, the the emotional devastation of having survived the war. Lee's older brother, Sam, you know, dealing with you know, not wanting to talk about the war when that's all that Lee wants to talk about. You know, how did how did all of these characters you know, come to mind for you and and how much of you is in these really, really rich, you know, emotionally connected characters? Yeah, so I'm not much of a sort of self-insert author. I know a lot of people find that a really useful way to craft characters. Um, I don't tend to, at least not explicitly, um, think about, you know, like this element of me is going into a character. But I think, you know, the the advice, write what you know, is generally, I think, stupid, <laughs> but it has elements of, of truth in terms of you're sort of writing what you know about what you don't know. Um, so a lot of the sort of emotional, um, I, I draw on my own experience for the, the sort of emotional um, trajectory of a character as opposed to any like specific traits or things like that. Um, but what I was really interested in, um, like, as I said before, that this is a book about aftermath um, and that, you know, you get all this all this fiction and all this attention on the event itself. Um, but I was really interested in what happens after um, I wrote my dissertation on on post apocalyptic fiction. So clearly this is a concern <laughs> of mine. Um, but yeah, so I was interested in what comes after. And and so I thought having sort of these these three characters and you know bringing other characters into it as well hugo you have a character so hugo is 18 at the start of the novel 17 18 so he you know grew up during the war but in a sort of it's it's 1949 now like he was a kid um wasn't really paying that much attention to it lee grows up during the war but as a young woman she's a teenager she's you know her brother Sam is away fighting. She has all these plans that when she turns 18, she's going to sign up for one of the women's services. And then the war ends right before she does. Um, so she ends up with a lot of these feelings of, of 
relief and guilt all at the same time, and especially in in her relationship with her brother. Um, and then and then Ian and Sam are are sort of um, foils of each other in 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 a lot of ways. Um, Ian's come back to his childhood home because he doesn't really have anything else to do and, you know, thinks about and talks about the war quite a lot because he thinks of it as being, you know, this, this really formative experience. He goes from, you know, his first year of university straight into the war and then comes out on the other side, having to decide what to do with the rest of his life. And, and Sam um, never comes home after the war. He's, you know, that's it. It's, it's, it's done for him. Um, and he really doesn't talk about it at all can't talk about it won't talk about it doesn't want to think about it um so a lot of a lot of the that sort of emotional trajectory for the characters came from that idea of aftermath and and the different ways that people experience these events um and how you move on or don't as the case may be um from those experiences uh after the fact and to end you know the idea that i think we are all sort of grappling with at different times in modern life of of thinking about like well what would i do like if if this sort of thing happened i think a lot of people sort of started confronting those questions even during the pandemic but you know it feels like we're living through all these cataclysmic events all the time and and so i thought that it was interesting to explore the aftermath of that you have you know sam and ian who did did something whether because they wanted to or they felt they had to and lee who wanted to do something and felt like she did nothing um and and yeah, so looking at how how individuals, um, you know, world events on a small scale, on an individual scale, and how that affects each person um, differently, right? You know, and I think the book does such an incredible job of capturing the way that trauma lives both in individuals and in community. Uh, and so, you know, curious, you know, for for the way that you present that kind of trauma and, and again, like the, the connections that you make between, you know, what happened in World War II and kind of that like constant feeling of trauma, you know, on the island, they they took such extreme steps as taking down the street signs, you know, with the with the belief that they were going to be invaded and they couldn't, you know, um, it, they didn't want people to be able to to take over the island that easily. Uh, and the connection to this kind of constant state of trauma that that it feels as if we are all living in now, you know, everything from, you know, what's happening in Ukraine to the climate crisis. And so uh, how important was it for you to accurately depict both individual and collective trauma and the different ways that people grapple with that because it is it's something your book is so cathartic for people trying to process you know the the trauma of living through today and so how did you how did you capture that yeah that was really um you know from the very beginning um of writing the book it was always you know you can go back to my early early notes and it's about you know grief trauma personal collective um so that was really important to me. I revised the book um, during lockdown. You know, it was it was so that became a really crucial part of how I was thinking about these things and 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 really influenced how I was thinking about the themes of the book. Um, you know, a lot of it became about the things that we do for each other in a community, the sacrifices we make for each other in a community, whether those are sort of big um, life changing sacrifices or or small things, um, the ways that we help each other or don't. Um, so yeah, so it was it was important to me to to, you know, the the there's the individual characters, the landscape of the island is a character, and the community of the island is a character and has its own um, sort of trajectory throughout the novel as well. Um, so yeah, it was certainly certainly front of mind. Um, and you know, a real part of the sort of raison d'etre of the book as well. Yeah. Oh, and that, that's so right. The the island itself is a character. It really is. It's such a central central component of the story. Um, and so I have a question from Trevor, and then I'll get to another terrific question from Molly. But Trevor's relates to you know the the individuals um, at that that help to make up the story. So Trevor's question is, were you able to discuss with um, elderly people their experience of the 1940s and 1950s? And, you know, weaving that in, like how, how, how if any, like did, did those conversations inform the storytelling? 
Yeah, so a little bit. Um, I had done, this is, this is funny, um, when I was like in elementary school, I did a big project on um, children's experiences of the war. So not, you know, a particularly academically rigorous project, but I had already, you know, I'd, I'd interviewed, you know, my grandparents, friends' grandparents, and that sort of thing. So I'd had sort of like a little bit of that um, background, um, but I didn't, um, I didn't explicitly seek out other sort of interviewees. Um, I did read accounts, um, sort of set primary, primary sources, but not from my own sort of um, field work. Um, and, and part of why I did that was that I was, it's, it's a war novel, but it's not a war novel. And I wanted to still feel, I, I was, I was hewing really accurately to the, the war sections, um, Ian's storyline. I wanted to still have some ability to, I, I wanted to be able to focus on on the emotional arc of this particular community, which would have had a really unique experience. Um, it's part of why I didn't set the island, like it, it's just an unnamed island. It's not, it's not um, sort of particularized. I wanted to have that freedom um, to, to sort of craft the story um, and the emotional arcs um, as needed. But I did, yeah, read a lot of accounts, um, both from veterans um, and, and civilians uh, who would lived through the war and had some sort of, you know, especially for the younger characters, um, had, some, had some concept um, from the conversation that I'd had, you know, with my own grandparents um, in, in the context of my, my eighth grade project and also uh other you know other conversations um to sort wow. of back that up it's amazing how that can come back right i you know, know. Yeah. To, to think about you know <laughs> what would have been 14 year old you you know yeah. going through that experience to be able to kind of call on that all these years later that's incredible yeah. uh and we have a question from molly now uh wondering um who is the author who has been the biggest inspiration to you Mm, that's really interesting. I think that it's it's hard to pin down to one person because especially as someone who sort of reads a lot of different genres and and doesn't really think of genres I'm writing, there's a lot of very different authors that I find really inspiring. But I think especially in the context of this book, um, Kate Atkinson's World War II novels are fantastic. She they're um, Life After Life and A God in Ruins are are the two um, that I love the most. She also has another one called Transcription. Um, and she she has a real knack for capturing the historical backdrop and and really feeling really accurate. Um, and and her her the the lead character of the protagonist of um, God and Ruins, who also appears in Life After Life, is a, an RAF bomber pilot. So I I found those those books and how they engaged with the war and aftermath of the war really, really inspiring. Um, she's such a beautiful writer. Um, I love also uh, Emily, St Emily St. John Mandel's works. I wrote about um, Station Eleven in my my dissertation and, you know, will read, would read her grocery lists if she would give them to me. She's such a, such a wonderful writer. Um, so I think those are probably the two, the two biggest, my two biggest um, literary crushes at the moment, as it were. I love that. And, you know, you, thinking about the, the the story that you've created and and kind of that like setting in World War II, would you ever go back to that as an author? Would you ever, you know, focus your writing in that in that time era? I could see myself writing something else um, set, you know, in and around the war. Um, I don't really have any plans to write any sort of sequel or anything like that. I'm a bit more of a one and done type of gal. Um, and also I, at least right now, uh, generally say that I'll die before I give a character a cell phone. So um, yeah, it's, I can definitely see myself going back. I'm, I'm working on something now that's set in the seventies. Um, I don't want to have to deal with people being able to Google things and <laughs> that whatnot. That is a so. phenomenal, phenomenal barrier <laughs> to set. I just love it. And I have to say, it's one of my, those things that um, irks me when I, you know, when we're watching a movie and the like cell phone bubble will pop up as part of the, the I'm like, stop it, make it go away. <laughs> Nobody wants to read anybody's text messages. 
<laughs> everybody's worst nightmare. So I love that. I love that barrier. Stay safe. <laughs> uh, so that brings me to Sue's next question when she says, what is your next novel? Can you share what you're working yeah. on? I can share a little bit. It's still very early in development, um, but I'm working on, it's um, a ghost story set in 1970s London um, around Highgate Cemetery. Um, and I sort of facetiously describe it to people. This does not capture the mood, but does capture the general idea as um, help. I live in a haunted house and the ghosts are unionizing. So that's the general, that's the teaser. Um, oh, wow. That, the the ghosts are unionizing. Oh, you got to <laughs> give us more. Come on, what's happening here? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's very early stages. Um, I'm still working through the first draft, um, but essentially a, a young woman inherits um, a house from her aunt. Um, the house is haunted uh, by, by ghosts of people who are buried in, in Highgate Cemetery, and she and several sort of new friends um, decide that they're going to figure out how to release the ghosts from this haunted house. Um, yeah, this is sort of oh, general. I love it. And so, so Emma, you said you're sort of genre agnostic, and of course, you know, the Wild Hunt is a thriller, and it's historical fiction, and you know, it's an it's an emotional family drama in so many ways. Uh, and so, what is making you want to go back then to to the theme of I wouldn't I would never call the Wild Hunt horror. I would, but but yeah. thriller, you know, and, and a ghost story is a thriller. So, so what is it about the that aspect that's that's calling you back to that genre? Yeah, it's so funny because <laughs> the book started being sort of advertised in certain in in some instances as being, you know, horror or thriller, and I, which just sort of baffled me at first because it's not at all what I set out to write. Um, I, I absolutely know it's spooky. I mean, I've been where I've been working, I've been living in this story for five years. It doesn't it's not scary to me anymore. Um, I know what happens and everything. So, so it was quite funny. Um, I'm the biggest scaredy cat in the entire world. I cannot watch horror movies. I cannot read horror novels. I will read the Wikipedia pages of horror movies so that I can feel like I'm in the loop without having to watch them. Um, so that was quite funny. So I don't think of myself as a, a horror or thriller writer. Um, I do find gothic um, quite interesting. And I think the difference there is is sort of the degree to which it's more about the interiority of the characters um, than it is about like trying to be scary. Um, but I think I'm interested in in just the, the sort of ideas that I'm interested in um, and the types of the types of interiority that I'm interested in lend themselves well to those sort of um, slightly otherworldly, which is always I think a little bit uncanny at, at least, um, and so lends itself to the the spooky, gothic, thriller-ish. Uh, totally, it does. Genre. Yeah, it's almost you know like like with the wild hunt is is less about the hunt, right, than than the unfinished business. Yeah. Um, and I think oh, the the line that of course like I can hear it in my head when because of course I did the audible, which was phenomenal. The the <laughs> um uh, the person the narrator for the audible was just fantastic. Uh, but the line that just stayed with me was, um, was, have you come to finish it? And of course, if you haven't read the book, you have to read the book. I'm not going to give away what that is, but the way that just a line like that can just live in you and, and scare the daylights out of you, even, <laughs> even when you're listening to it in daylight, you know, but it's not, it's not scary. It's not gory. It's haunting. Mm -hmm. And that, that idea of that unfinished business and the slew of representing kind of those souls who, who haven't moved on. It's just incredible. So in Unfinished Business, Lisa has a question then. So where do you see yourself in 20 years? Oh, gosh. Um, I, so I'm, I'm here in Cambridge doing, doing my master's, master's research. I would quite like to, to stay in academia. Um, I quite like having, you know, something, uh, some sort of structure um, to my schedule, in addition to, to working on my creative projects, if I'm if I only have you know my own writing to do, um, I find it really hard actually to be motivated. And then you end up, you know, if if you're if you're doing it for yourself and you don't write for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, you're like, oh well, like bad me, but you know, whatever. And then if you're doing it, if it's the only thing that you're supposed to be working on, it's like, oh man, I haven't gone to work in two weeks, like, <laughs> and I was not on vacation. Um, so I quite like having having something else. Um, 
to be working on. And I, I really enjoy um, academic study and, and research and engaging with, with other people's writing. Um, so yeah, I'd love to be, you know, in the UK still um, working on my research, working on, on books and, you know, I, I don't really think that far ahead in my future. Otherwise, it feels feels really far away. So I have, you know, the, the broad strokes of sort of sort of doing what I'm doing, um, but but better, hopefully. <laughs> what do you enjoy the most about being an author? What what do you enjoy the most about the writing process? Mm, I always say that writing is horrible, but having written is fantastic. Um, writing is, is, you know, it's, it's hard work. Um, having written is great. Um, revising is great. Engaging with people who, who read, who read what you've written and who it's resonated with is fantastic, especially when people, um, have picked up on things that you weren't thinking about when you were writing the book and people say this is this is what it meant to me and it, and it, that it takes on sort of a life of its own um is really exciting it's 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 nerve-wracking at times you, when you have to say you know i'm letting it go and people are gonna interpret it how they will but it's it's really exciting um so yeah so i think just seeing being able to being able to tell a story um and and giving it life and then seeing just where it goes is is yeah really exciting yeah and you know for me like the the wild hunt i was not expecting to cry and, and you know it was it was yeah i was expecting you know from from the absolutely beautiful cover and kind of the the lead up to it i was totally expecting it to be this kind of like intensive thriller throughout and then find mm. myself bawling at the end <laughs> uh, but you know, for that like what what is something that somebody took away from the wild hunt that they've shared with you that surprised you that that you didn't anticipate um oh i think it's just interesting it's been interesting to talk to people about about how they um sort of connect to the feelings of catharsis in the novel and you know i've had people say that it it sort of mirrored their experiences with um with mental illness in some cases um and so i found that really you know those are really sort of touching conversations to have um I mean, the most the most surprising thing is people being like, "It's a horror novel," and I'm like, "Yeah, how could I have written a horror novel?" Um, and I think that if you're if you're wanting a horror novel and you go into the Wild Hunt, you'll be a little bit surprised <laughs> and disappointed. But so that was that I find that just quite amusing, but also a really great example about how you know books belong to their readers and people are gonna um, interpret things in different ways and and feel different ways about about what you've written, and that's you know the beauty in it. Yeah, I love that. Books belong to the readers and it is. I think this this hits so many people in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Like it's spine chilling, but it is. It's just so deeply, deeply touching to see this community come together. I'm so excited for anybody who reads it. Oh, the ending will just make your heart swell. I think, I think it's just so <laughs> special. Uh, and so on the emotional side, last question from Lisa, and then I'm going to get into some of your St. Andrew's favorites before we let you get, get back to your writing. Uh, so Lisa's question is, what is being an author like in terms of one's emotions? So I think she's asking, like, what's it like managing your emotions as, as you're writing? Yeah, it's it's a lot. <laughs> it's such an internal, like, solitary act in a lot of ways. You know, there, there are great moments of community in it, um, but but they usually come, you know, at the beginning when you're sort of workshopping an idea and then you really have to do the, the meat of it by yourself. Um, so you really do have to be able to sort of manage your own expectations and, and emotions. Um, yeah, I think just, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on this yet, having, having just published my first book, but I know that now as I'm, as I'm writing my second, working on it now, it's definitely an exercise in sort of tuning everything else out, um, not thinking about, you know, how people are receiving this book, not thinking about how people will receive what I'm writing. It's the first time that I've written something um, with, with the expectation that it will have, you know, public readership. So, so that's um, an interesting, an interesting challenge and, a, and an ongoing one. Um, and then I think also, yeah, the, the, as we sort of touched on before, um, making sure you have those people that you can you can turn to when you're like everything I've ever written is terrible, um, or when you have those moments of rejection, um, 
and just making sure you you have a sort of a support system um, and taking time away from it. You know, I'm not one of the people who says that you have to write every single day. Sometimes you need to take some days off and just let things percolate um, and and get some emotional distance from from a project um, to to make sure that you're on the right track and you know things come to you when you when you set them aside for a bit. Um, yeah. I hope that answers. I think, <laughs> that oh, that's so neat. And you, you know, it, it does, you know, you spoke about St. Andrews and how it is, it's such a community of people who are self-directed and self-motivated. And, you know, you graduated five years ago, but I can tell you very firmly that that, that stands true today. Uh, and and you, would, you would need that, right, as an author, because at that point, it's just you driving you uh, to get there. So, you know, talking a little bit more about your time at St. Andrews, let's dig into some of your favorites. I would okay. love to hear a little bit more uh, about some of those things that resonate with you. So I'll do just kind of rapid fire favorites okay. for us. What was your favorite St. Andrews restaurant? Um, uh, uh, I loved Maisha, the Indian uh, place. The student, the student takeaway deal. Oof, I miss that. Miss that bad boy. Oh, there you great. go. We'll just have to, you know, pop on up from Cambridge. And, I know. Uh, and, you know, you can still enjoy <laughs> it. Great. Excellent. All right. So favorite coffee or tea shop? Taste. Oh, of course. Um, favorite time of the year in St. Andrews? Ooh. That's really hard because I both, I love like just the beginning of the school year, like that, that early fall time. But also um, spring in St. Andrews is so nice when you start to get those longer days. Um, so probably, probably spring. Oh, good answer. There you go. <laughs> um, and your favorite beach, of course, it did not go and notice that the island had an East Sands and a West Sands. So yes, West Sands is my favorite beach. There you go. West Sands for you. What was your favorite course or module when you're at St. Andrews? Oh, gosh, I, I got to take so many fantastic ones. But I think mm. the one that was sort of the most different and, and the most exciting um, for that reason was I took um, Shakespeare and film. Um, with uh, Dr. Abby Shin, and it was fantastic. We, you know, each re week we we read one of Shakespeare's plays, and then at the end of the week we watched the movie adaptation. Um, and it was, I find adaptation fascinating, um, and to engage with, you know, something very contemporary in film and and very old and and foundational. Um, and Shakespeare was like a really a really fascinating blend of of disciplines and and media. Oh, that would be so much fun. I love it. How about um, academic family connection? Something with your academic family that's memorable? Yeah, I have um, I have two academic daughters um, who I'm still still in touch with. They are delightful. Um, and and I have academic nieces and nephews as well. And I recently sort of reconnected with one of my academic nieces who lives down in London. Um, and and we spent you know a fair amount of time together. Uh, just in the past couple of years when I've been been in London. And so that's really exciting um, and, and special, you know, five years after leaving St. Andrews to, to sort of, yeah, reconnect with academic family um, in that way. Love it, wonderful. And just your overall St. Andrews memory, what's, what's some, one, something favorite that sticks out for you? Oh, wow. It was such a great time all around, but um, one thing that was really memorable was we, uh, <laughs> at the end of grad ball, so in, you know, the early, early, early hours of morning, or I guess not that early, it was probably like three or four, we um, jumped fence into the castle um, <laughs> and watched, well sun, watched the sunrise from, oh. from the castle, which was just, you know, such a special, um, such a special moment. Yeah. Oh, totally. That'll that'll live in the memory bank for a long time. That's yeah. fantastic. Uh, Emma, before you depart, just any, you know, words of wisdom for um, for aspiring authors, particularly those at St. Andrews, what, what would you leave them with if they, they think of their own uh, writing? Yeah, I think um, I think just and this sounds sort of, you know, trite, but knowing knowing the story that you're trying to tell. And I don't really mean that in any um, plot way as opposed to you know why why are you writing what you're writing what is it that you're accomplishing for you um and if you know that um and and have a real strong sense of of why um you're working on what you're working on it becomes a lot easier to 
you know, if you end up working with with editors and other people who have their own opinions on the book, knowing what you're willing to change and what you're not willing to change, and also just in in moments of um, rejection or discouragement, saying, okay, well, it's fine that this person doesn't like X Y Z part of my work because that's you know the point, and it's just not for them, and it'll be for someone else, um, and it is for me. Um, and I think having that sense of of sort of um, confidence in the in the heart of of what you're working on really will serve you well um, in all aspects of your your writing life. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Emma. It was such a joy getting to chat with you about The Wild Hunt, which is available now. Uh, as I mentioned, I'd listen to mine on Audible. You can order it from any any number of bookstores. If you want more of Emma's amazing writing as well as photography, you can go to emmaseckle.com. For all of our alumni and friends and parents, we are so thankful that you joined us today for this event. We have many and more uh, activities, both online and in person. Um, a reminder that our London Carol service is coming back in early December on the 7th, and then also St. Andrew's Carol service in St. Salvador is um, taking place on December 14th. So please update your contact information to make sure that, that we can share these great opportunities with you. Again, thank you to all those who joined and their questions. I want to leave you um, Emma, with a few more words of thanks from some of the participants today. Amelia Sanders, thanks you so much for your amazing talk. Wishing you all the best in your career and looking forward to your exciting book. And from Lisa, thank you, Emma. It's been wonderful and inspirational hearing about your writing process. Definitely recommending to my book club. It's a great, great book club <laughs> book. So Emma, we're such a joy having you. Thank you. We're so proud to claim you as St. Andrew's alumna and wishing you all the best in your next adventure. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. It was great. I know. Bye-bye.